Amen. Thank you, Lydia. Uh, one more thing I want to let you know about today at 4 p.m. at Michael Earth, we're going to have beach baptisms. We have 15 people so far being signed up to be baptized today. And uh, if you are here and you've never been baptized and you want to do that, we encourage you to join us. You can see Kathy Fox or one of the leaders out at the Next Steps table. Uh, if you've already been baptized, this is a great chance to come down and stand with and celebrate with those who are making that public declaration of their faith. We're going to do this in the ocean. And that is always eventful. Uh, you never know what might happen. So it's going to be a great day. The game will be over by then. So you can come on out and, uh, and join us at Michaelers Beach, 4 p.m. today. It's going to be a great time. Uh, we're going to have some worship and uh, baptism of these individuals and celebrate together. Amen? Uh, before I get into the message, we're going through the book of 1 Samuel uh, together as a church and in our life groups and with our blog. But before I get into that message today, I felt like it was important for me uh, to make some statements about what's happening right now in Israel. And why, why should a church stand in support with Israel? The relationship between Christians and Israel is complex and deeply rooted in a, our biblical heritage. It's important for us to understand the relationship and why we stand in support with Israel for several reasons. Um, it, this is not political. What's happening in the world right now is not, it's not about politics. It's, these are not freedom fighters. This is hatred of a group of people. This is hatred of Jews. And it's the intent to exterminate an entire group of people. Prior to the attacks on Israel, uh, an organization, an Ancestry.com organization known as 23andMe was hacked. But the only people's information that was ta were taken was Ashkenazi Jews. An international jihad was issued against Jews everywhere. Not, this is not just about politics. And this is ongoing. This is not new. This is just the newest, newest thing that's happening. Uh, several years ago, uh, at an important time, as kind of a, I, there was a, it was a holiday and it was an anniversary of some things that had taken place in Israel. We decided that we needed to do something about that. And I was doing Youthquake Live at the time, and Youthquake Live partnered with Paul Wilbur. Many of you know Paul Wilbur. He was a leader in the Messianic uh, Jewish movement. We partnered with him and his ministry to do something we felt was very significant for young people to understand, because anti Semitism is higher now than it was prior to World War II. And there were things that were happening in the world that we wanted to make sure young people and teenagers knew about and knew why we should not allow that to happen again. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the famous German theologian, uh, he said prior to the Holocaust, the sin of the church was its silence, its unwillingness to say anything or do anything. What we do not want to do is sit by and let that happen again, let history repeat itself again. And so we did this event for teenagers. We called it Never Again, because that's one of the things that is said in Israel. That's kind of a statement in Israel, Never Again. And so we, we did that. We took that stand. It's the only youth quake in 29 years where I've had personal death threats anonymously sent to here and to the church that was hosting youth quake. The church that was hosting Youthquake got mail and they had this whole thing it put together and it was, it was death threats because of our stance. And that had nothing to do with politics. That had nothing to do with policy. That was not about freedom fighters. Let's not be confused by that. There's a spiritual thing that's happening here and from the pages of the Old Testament, it's clear that Israel holds a very unique place in God's plan. And Genesis 12, God tells Abraham, I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse Whitey Hogan, who was a very well-known uh, Episcopal uh, priest here in the city, and he was one of the early leaders of the charismatic renewal in the Episcopal Church. He later became one of the founders of the Anglican Church in North America. He wrote a number of books. One of the books he wrote was called The Last Teachings of Christ, but before he even gets into that, he gives context. And he, he, he says the whole context of Jewish history is every man's history. Jewish history is a microcosm of all human history. God chose a group of people to reveal the condition of the human heart and what it means to be in relationship with God. And he goes on to, he goes on to say that Jewish history raises the reality of imperfection in every human heart and the consequent need for a personal savior and Lord. So we see that our, our connection as Christians, we believe in the unchanging promises of God. Support, supporting Israel in this way honors God's covenant with his chosen people, but it's also important for us to remember that Jesus, our Lord and Savior, was a Jew. 
He was born into a Jewish family and lived as a Jewish man. His teachings and ministry were deeply rooted in Jewish tradition and scriptures. Early Christians were considered a Jewish, a Jewish sect. By supporting Israel, we acknowledge our connection to our Jewish roots and faith. In Romans chapter 14, the Apostle Paul encourages us to make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Supporting Israel can contribute to peace in the Middle East. It is a call for unity as we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, as mentioned in Psalm 122. Supporting Israel can also serve as a bridge to strengthen interfaith relationship. This past week, Tuesday night, there was an event at the Jewish Community Center in Jacksonville as people from all around the Jewish community are feeling the pressure, feeling the anxiety, feeling the fear, feeling the vulnerability, they begin to gather together to stand as a community. We sent two of our leaders over to be with them. Pastor Jarrett McConnell and Michael Gunning went over to be at that event, to represent us, to say, we're gonna stand with you. It builds a bridge, it cultivates relationship, it's an opportunity to engage in dialogue and cooperation with our Jewish brothers and sisters. It also is important to note that Israel has a history of providing refuge for Jewish and non-Jewish people facing persecution. And we'll partner in humanitarian efforts. When we were there years ago uh, on a trip to Israel, we had the privilege of touring a very well-known hospital in Jerusalem. And they're taking us on this tour of this hospital and showing us some of the groundbreaking research they have done that benefits everybody. But we also learned that that hospital has been attacked by terrorists multiple times, by radical extremists, multiple times. In many cases, the person doing the attack themselves was injured. And the people, the doctors and nurses in the hospital take them in and cared for them. And we see the humanitarian efforts they have there and around the world. Christians are called to care for the oppressed, to support those seeking shelter and harm. By standing with Israel, we support this vital mission. This week, I was in contact with a friend of mine. His name is Ben Juster. Ben is the son of Dan Juster. Dan is one of the founders of a ministry called Tikkun Israel and author of many books. Ben lives part-time here in Orange Park area, and he's a part of a congregation out there and part-time in Israel. And I, I didn't know that he was actually in Israel when I texted him, and he responded that he was in Israel you know, this week and asked him how he was doing, how things are going, and, and he said a lot of the things that all of us have heard on the news. And he also sent me a link to some organizations that are providing humanitarian relief that we're gonna let you know about in case you wanna do something more personal and contribute to some of those relief efforts. We're gonna make, let you know about this. We also have a statement that we wanna make as a church, and I will make this available to any of you that may want to repeat this in some way. As a community bound by our faith in Jesus Christ, we affirm our commitment to upholding the sacred dignity of human rights and in all individuals, Jewish, Palestinian, or any others caught in this conflict. We recognize the complexities and hardship faced by the people of Israel in their pursuit of peace and security. It is with a heart full of compassion and love that we affirm our collective pledge to stand alongside them, denouncing any form of violence or oppression perpetrated by extremist groups, including Hamas or other terrorists. We will actively and openly demonstrate our support for Israel through various means, public prayer and services, we commit to dedicating specific times during our worship services to pray for the peace, protection, and prosperity of Israel. We believe in the power of intercession and seek God's guidance and blessing for the nation and its people, as Psalm 122 tells us to do. We will encourage others to pray. We will actively encourage our fellow Christians and communities to join us in prayer for Israel. By fostering a culture of intercession, we aim to create a ripple effect of love, support, and spiritual solidarity. We will also do this by supporting emergency efforts. To the best of our abilities, we will contribute towards emergency release efforts and relief efforts and that aid the affected communities. We understand the urgency of providing assistance during times of crisis and endeavor to do so with a spirit of generosity and compassion. In expressing our solidarity with Israel, we are reminded of the scriptural exhortation in Genesis chapter 12, 
where God promises to bless those who bless the descendants of Abraham. We are grateful for the blessings that have flowed from our support to Israel, and we trust that, God will, that God's favor will continue to rest upon us as we stand together in love and unity. We'll make that statement available for anybody that might want it. Uh, you don't need to do that, but I encourage you to do something. There's also a book I wanna let you know about. There's, we have a QR code. It's a free download if you're interested. It's called Why Still Support Israel? Um, Why Still Care About Israel? And this was written by Sandra Toplinski. Uh, Sandra and her husband, Carrie, attend church here when they're not in Israel. She's written a number of books, including most of you know Dr. Raleigh Washington, who's spoken here a number of times. She co-wrote several books with Dr. Washington. And this is a free download that helps you understand you know, why it's important to care about Israel. You can look at that if you'd like. We'll have that QR code available other places as well. I wanna encourage you also to check on your Jewish neighbors and friends. Trust me, they're feeling a level of anxiety that most of us don't understand. When it seems like the world is out to exterminate you, it's a pretty heavy anxiety to live with. Would you join me and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now, God, and we lift up the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, but Jewish people everywhere. God, we pray that the, they would experience the comfort of your Holy Spirit. God, we pray that you would bring people around that would stand with them, support them, allow them to know they're not alone, they're not isolated. God, that we're not gonna stand idly by and watch this kind of brutality. God, help us to do our part, to pray, to give, to do whatever we can do to stand with them in this way. God, we ask for wisdom and guidance for everybody involved. And we pray specifically protection over all the innocent people that are getting swept up into this on every side. We know there are innocent people that are getting hurt everywhere in, in Israel and the Gaza Strip and other places. We pray, God, for your protection over them. And we pray, God, for a quick and peaceful resolution to this conflict. We commit it into your hands, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, thank you. Okay, 1 Samuel chapter 12. You guys ready? Okay. Uh, let me ask you a question that I know you don't know the answer to. If anyone knows the answer to this, I'll be amazed. No Googling. What was the number one song in 1980 on the country and pop charts? Any guesses? Convoy, that's a good guess. Islands in the stream, okay? I'm seeing the difference in personalities here. Uh, I'll just go ahead and tell you. The number one song in 1980 on the country and pop charts is one that you all know. And it's, it's this, looking for love and... See, you all know it. You probably don't know who sang it, but we all know that song. It was number one in country, number one pop. It was featured in the movie Urban Cowboy. Looking for love in all the wrong places. Looking for love in too many faces. Searching their eyes, looking for traces of what I'm dreaming of. Goes on from there, right? So, the, and we all know this and it resonates with us because we all understand it. Because this is what we're all seeking and looking for and searching for. And the fact that what the soul craves, what all of us are looking for is love, is the greatest evidence that what we're all actually searching for is God himself. Because God is love. And too many times we're looking for love in all the wrong places. And as we walk through this passage together today, we're gonna to discover, we're gonna discover a gospel thread of Jesus as our savior. And we're gonna see Israel's temptation to find solutions in other places, but it always brings us back to this. Would you stand with me for the reading of scripture today? 1 Samuel chapter 12 is lengthy, so I'm not gonna read the whole thing. I'm just gonna read verses 16 through 22, and then we'll pick it up from there. Now, therefore, stand still and see this great thing that the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not the wheat harvest today? I will call upon the Lord that he may send thunder and rain, and you shall know and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord and asking yourselves for a king. So Samuel called upon the Lord and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And all the people said to Samuel, pray for your servants 
to the Lord your God that we may not die, for we have added to all of our sin this evil. For we asked ourselves a king. And Samuel said to the people, do not be afraid. You have done all this evil, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And do not turn aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver, for they're empty. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because he is pleased, because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So we, we see here their temptation to, to search in all the wrong places. When you go back, I want to encourage you to go back and read the entire chapter in your own devotion, maybe later today or tomorrow morning or with your life group as you gather. And in verses one through five, you really see, Samuel begins addressing the people of Israel as he nears the end of his life. And Samuel has been a faithful, upright leader, a judge, a prophet. And he's reminded, he's reminding the people of Israel their history. And he highlights that their desire for a king to rule over them, despite the fact that God was their true king, is really a request driven by a lack of trust in God and a desire to be like other nations. They were looking for answers in all the wrong places. In our own lives, we often seek worldly solutions and human leadership to fulfill our needs and desires, just as the Israelites did. We can find ourselves looking to people and possessions and power to save us. But we learn from the Israelites, human leadership and human relationships alone are insufficient to meet our deepest spiritual needs. In the gospel, John chapter four, Jesus, there's this famous story of Jesus and this woman at the well. He goes to the well to get a drink because he's thirsty and he asks this woman for a drink and begins this whole conversation with her. And he he tells her, you know, people can drink at this well and they'll be thirsty again, but I can, I'm the only one that can quench their thirst. And he explains to her that she spent her whole life seeking answers and trying to find love in all these relationships. And she's been married all these times. And even the person she's with now is not her husband. And none of these things are satisfying that deepest craving, right? We're all like this. We're all looking for love in all the wrong places. Jesus says in John 4, he answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never be thirsty. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So, so many times we're, we're doing exactly the same thing. We're, we're searching for answers. We're trying to find meaning. We're trying to find identity in something else. It always brings us back to this reality. It can't satisfy. Only a relationship with God can. That's what we ultimately crave. And then in verses six through 11, Samuel reminds them of God's faithfulness throughout their history. So, so he takes them through this progression. Like, like, this is what you guys keep doing. God delivers you, then you forget about God. Then you repent, you cry out to God, he delivers you, then you forget about God. Then you repent, he delivers you, then you forget about God. Then you cry out to God, you repent, he delivers you. Like this process they keep going through. And we're no different, we keep doing the same thing, right? That's what's happening here. Remember what Pastor Hogan said, that it's a microcosm of of all human history. This is revealing what's actually in each one of our own hearts. We all do this. Despite our unfaithfulness, despite the Israelites' flawed choice, God in his infinite mercy provided them with Saul as their king. God allowed them to experience the consequences of their decision, but he remained faithful to his covenant with them. This is a beautiful foreshadowing of the gospel message we find in Jesus as Messiah. Just as God provided Saul, a king who would reveal the shortcomings of human leadership, God would later provide Jesus, a true king and savior. Jesus would come to reveal our need for salvation and to offer it freely through his life, death, and resurrection. In our brokenness, God remains faithful and he offers us his grace. Paul told this to Timothy. He said, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. Why? Because that is his nature. It is our nature to fall away, to pull away, to be faithless. God's nature is faithful. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. 
In Exodus chapter 34, we see this play out. Now, it's one of my favorite passages of scripture because it's the only place in the Bible you can read God's description of himself. Everywhere else, we read like an angel or a prophet or somebody that's writing. But here in Exodus 34, we read God describing himself. Israel has come out of Egypt. Moses is up on Mount Sinai. And Israel's down at the bottom, right? And this is the very same time they're telling Aaron, build us, who's God? Show us what God is. And they make this golden calf, right? And meanwhile, Moses is up and he's saying, God, show me your glory. I wanna see your glory. If you're gonna send me out, I gotta know you're with me. I wanna see your glory. And God says, I can't do that because you just couldn't handle it. But here's what I will do. You get in the cleft of the rock and I'll kind of shield you and I'll pass by. And then in some translations it's saying, you can, you can see my back. But it actually a better understanding of that is as I pass by, you'll see the wake of my glory. And that's what happens in Exodus 34. And, and God declares several things about himself as he passes by. In Hebrew, there are 13 attributes. It's one of the oldest known liturgies in Judeo-Christian worship known as the 13 attributes of God. In our English translations, they number differently, but in Hebrew, it's 13. Exodus 34. The Lord passed by him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. This is who God declares he is. This is his nature. He is faithful. And Samuel reminds them of their unfaithfulness, but God's faithfulness. And then in verse 16 through 22, that's the portion we read together, Samuel, as both prophet and judge, served as a mediator between the people and God. He interceded on their behalf and reminded them of God's goodness and faithfulness. In this role, he foreshadowed the ultimate prophet and intercessor, Jesus, as Messiah. Jesus served as our mediator, bridging the gap between a holy God and fallen humanity. He intercedes for us, standing in the gap for our sins and reminding us of God's goodness, grace, and mercy. He's the ultimate connection between us and God the Father. So, so you see Jesus as our intercessor. This is, to me, this is so helpful and it helps me. It reminds me of who God is, of his awesomeness, of his holiness, but it reminds but, it, but it's back to me, reminded me of God's faithfulness and his mercy and his grace towards me, right? That's what he does. It kind of goes both ways. He intercedes on our behalf because we cannot save ourselves, but he brings it back to us, revealing God's mercy and grace to us. First Timothy chapter two, it says, for there is one God, there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this, I was appointed a preacher and apostle. So Paul's saying, look, this is the deal. There's one mediator between God and man, and it's Jesus. And this passage in Samuel is, is reminding us of that. It's pointing us towards that. Remember, Paul said, all these things, the Old Testament feasts and festivals and scriptures, these are all shadows pointing us to something else. The reality is found in Christ. It also emphasizes to us our need for a savior. 1 Samuel 12 emphasizes the importance of repentance and turning back to God. Samuel urges the Israelites to serve God with all their hearts and recognize their need for him. Verse 23, he says, Moreover, as for me, far be it for me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, and I will instruct you in the good and right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. For consider what great things he's done for you. This message resonates throughout the Bible, bringing us, culminating in the gospel message of Jesus. In Luke chapter 19, there's a story of Jesus where he's with this guy named Zacchaeus, who is a Jewish tax collector. So he's kind of, he's sort of betrayed his own people. And in this encounter he has with Jesus, it so impacts his life that he repents right there of all that he's done wrong. And Jesus says in verse 19, today salvation has come to this house since he also is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save the lost. In Samuel, they repented of their decision. We too need to repent 
of our decisions to look to anything else to give us value. Repentance and faith is all the gospel requires. And people ask sometimes, well, what about obedience? What about all those things? Obedience is what the gospel produces. It's not how you get it. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. When our acceptance is based on our performance, we exacerbate two root sins in our own heart, pride and fear. In Jesus, there's nothing you can do that will make you love you more, make him love you more. There's nothing you have done that will make him love you less. You can't earn it, you don't deserve it. We don't get there that way. We need a savior. We cannot earn it. It is by faith. Gabriel, uh, my oldest son, who was up here singing earlier when he was a little boy, I was serving as a youth pastor. And uh, we took the youth group on a trip to Tampa to go to a conference down there. And we decided we were gonna stay an additional day and take the youth group to Bush Gardens. And like you do on these youth trips, you have the whole youth group broken up into small groups with the leaders so there's good accountability and you know, where everybody's at and make sure everybody's safe. And so we had them all broke in their groups, but I decided I was gonna just hang with Gabe that day. And he was like eight or nine years old at the time. And so I said to Gabe, as, as the groups all went on their own way, uh, I said to Gabe, I said, Gabe, you're with me. I'm with you today. Today is your day. Anything you wanna do, we're gonna do. This is your day. Okay, dad. Like, I, in other words, I'm not gonna pressure you like I normally do <laughs> to ride the things that I wanna ride. And then we get on, oh no, you can handle it. You're gonna love it. And then I watch how afraid you are and I get some sort of sick joy out of seeing your fear. <laughs> you know, I'm not gonna do that today. Today's your day. You choose, whatever we wanna do, we're gonna do that. And so we did, and back then they had this one ride called the Crazy Camel. Thank God it's not there anymore. It was called the Crazy Camel, and we rode that thing eight or nine times. And this is one of those ones that it spins a lot. Like I can do the up and down, I love roller coasters, but the spinny thing, oh man, I just can't do that anymore. We rode that like eight or nine times. And we went and we did other things. And somewhere midway through near the end of the day, we're walking through the park and Gabe says, hey dad, can we stop for a minute? So we kind of move off over the, out of the main aisle and just stand in there talking for a minute. And he reaches in his pocket. Here dad. And I hold my hand out and he puts 49 cents in my hand. And I go, what's that? And he goes, you deserve it. He said, you've been doing everything I wanna do and not the things you wanna do. I said, no, Gabe, actually, this is what I wanna do. I wanna be with you. And I don't do that for you to pay me, you, you know? And a couple of things really struck me about that moment. One is, I, he can't pay me to love him. His 49 cents, <laughs> like that's gonna really, like, and it made me think of how many times we try to do something that we think, well, God's really gonna, really? Your offering of whatever it might be, your million dollars, you think that's something to a guy that has streets paved of gold? Like we can't, we can't earn it, it's not about earning it. The second thing is this though, when unconditional love is given, the response is to give. I wanna, I wanna get, he, he wanted to do that, I never asked him to do that. That came out of his heart, he felt gratitude, he felt grateful. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it, we receive it. But when we receive it, the response back is gratitude. It's, it's to give, whatever that is, give worship, give whatever it is that we give. In 1 Samuel chapter 12, we see this gospel thread of Jesus as our savior, woven throughout the narrative. The brokenness of human leadership, God's faithfulness despite our unfaithfulness, the role of prophet and intercessor, the need for a savior, all this points to the redemptive work of Jesus. Just as the Israelites needed a savior, so do we. May we embrace Jesus as our king, mediator, and ultimate savior, recognizing our need for his grace and forgiveness. Amen. Would you stand with me? We're gonna prepare to come to communion here in just a moment. We receive communion every Sunday because it brings us back to the reality of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That is the gravitational center of our faith. 
it reminds us that we can't earn it, we don't deserve it, that we are in right standing with God because of what he has done for us. It brings us right back to that. But it is important for us to take a moment and evaluate our own hearts in a time like this. Where, like the Israelites in the story, have we turned to other things? Have we turned away from God? Where are we looking for some other something else to fill that longing. We're looking for meaning, we're looking for love, we're searching for those answers, but are we turning away and looking in the wrong places? Let's repent of that and turn back to the Lord. This is what Samuel encourages the people to do and it's what we need to do. If there's anything in your life right now that you're looking to like that, that's taking that place that only God can have, Let's lay those things down. Let's return our hearts to the Lord fully today. The Bible also says that this is an opportunity and appropriate for us to evaluate and examine our own hearts. Here's the reality. We all fall short. We all sin. So just think about this yourself. Take a moment and evaluate your own heart. What is it in your life right now today? Don't let it be generic, not some random generic thing, but what is it? Let's take a moment. It's about close your eyes. Let's bow our hearts. I'm gonna give you a moment just in silent prayer confession. Just say those things to the Lord in your own heart. The things you need to turn away from that you're looking to for value and identity and answers and to make you feel loved and special. Let's turn our hearts to the Lord. Now I'm gonna lead us in a prayer of confession. Because the Bible says if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. And then a prayer of confession, confessing Jesus as our Lord. Because it's with your heart that you believe and your mouth that you confess and are saved. And then Jared's gonna come and lead us through communion. Repeat this after me. Heavenly Father, I confess that I have sinned against you in my thoughts, my words, and my actions. Have mercy on me and forgive me through your Son, my Savior. Lord Jesus, I believe you lived on this earth. You died for my sin. You rose and now live. I receive you as my Lord. Holy Spirit, fill me with power and passion to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. At this time, we'd like to invite